from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I am in the commentary box at the Oval in South London. Today we've got the test match against England's men in South Africa. It's the last of the summer and it does feel like it's getting to the end of the summer here because the weather has suddenly turned after we've had glorious hot sunshine. It's rain, rain, rain. But of course we won't have a test match this late in the summer next year because everything is going to be crammed into June and July with a window for the 100 in August. Whether that continues, we'll await to see. But for the moment, one day cricket is aside and it's back to the glorious five-day game. Ah, we love that red ball. Well, some of us. Jim Maxwell in (laughs) Sydney and we're watching cricket in Australia up in Queensland where it's like the middle of summer up there, much warmer in Townsville and Cairns and uh, Zimbabwe pulled off an amazing win the other day as we're about to hear and now New Zealand are giving Australia a, a bit of a rock and roll in their 3-1 dais. Well, enjoy red ball cricket till it lasts. Hi, this is Charu Sharma. Glad to be back home, or should I say on Stumped again, back in Bangalore, where unfortunately the city is flooded, so there's a lot of chaos. But uh, it was nice being in Kenya for a while, and the fact that you know the first steps are being taken for revival of cricket in Kenya just pleases me and I'm sure the cricket world as well. But in India, there's a lot of lament, criticism, of course, too, uh, at India's dismal performance in the Asia Cup, not reaching the final. Uh, That's a bit of a shame. But, you know, life goes on. Does Chari. We're glad to have you back. Enjoyed your postcard from Kenya, by the way. Thank you for sending that. It made it via snail mail, air mail. Um, It's nice to see you again. Now, Jim, you've already mentioned our first topic for this week. And that is because for the first time ever, Zimbabwe beats Australia in Australia. It came in the third of three one-day internationals, the second of which Zimbabwe were comprehensively thrashed, managing only 96 runs with the bat. But after that, the Zimbabwe head coach Dave Houghton said that there was quite a big skill gap uh, between the teams. But that just didn't seem the case days later when the tourists then won by three wickets. And the star for Zimbabwe was Ryan Burl, who took five wickets for just 10 runs and joins us on the show this week. It's really nice to have you on. I mean, has that result in the performance sort of had a chance to sink in? Uh, I think slightly. Um, I think as you can see, I'm obviously, you know, grinning from ear to ear. Um but yeah, I've obviously had a few days to reflect on it. Um, and yeah, I'm still absolutely buzzing. Um, but yeah, we've obviously got the T20 World Cup coming up. So a bit of confidence going into that um, and a lot to look forward to. I mean, when I was looking at the, at the wickets that you took and following the match, it was Josh Hazelwood, Mitchell Stark, Ashton Agar, Glenn Maxwell and David Warner when he was on 94. Talk us through those and which, well, which was your favourite, I suppose? <laughs> To begin, I think uh, I got Maxwell out first, um, and in the first the first ODI, he gave me a bit of a slap. Um, so it was obviously, you know, quite nice to to get him um, get one back over him, um, you know, with a nice caught and bowled. Um, second wicket was honestly a gift. Um, I, I think I, I tossed up a, a full toss, and Agar just uh, you know clipped it to mid wicket. So that was a, that was a bit of a gift. Um, and then obviously uh, Davy Warner on ninety four, probably trying to take on. Um, you know, the boundary option to try and get his 100 um, and obviously miscuing that. So that was a good one. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think the, se- the, th- the second last one was Starkey, um, a little bit slower in the air, uh, managed to get him bold. Um, and then the last one, uh, just got one to just go a little bit quicker through and, and, and find Hazelwood's edge to get the five. So very happy. Um, and yeah, like I said, grinning from year to year. Jim Maxwell in uh, Sydney, a, a magnificent performance, but after getting that uh, hammering right in the, the second ADI, did you believe that uh, this result was possible for Zimbabwe? So, to be honest, Jim, I think, you know, kind of looking at the, the early, um, you know, summer pitch, or I, I don't know if you refer it as to the winter pitch here in Australia, um, we kind of knew that the, the tosses were going to play a massive part in the game. Um, so we always kind of said to ourselves, you know, even after the first game, we just said, you know, we win a toss, we're bowling first, we're going to put them under the pressure. Um, so it, it wasn't ideal. We had a word with our captain because I think he had lost five out of five tosses. Um, he lost all the tosses against India, lost the first two against Australia. So 
we were we were pretty close to to subbing him out just for someone else to do a toss. Um, but no, we obviously, like I said, we were really pumped um, throughout. Even though we were we were losing, um, we kind of just knew that you know just winning a toss, giving ourselves the best chance possible um, to kind of restrict Australia. I saw on the social media a, a bit of carry on and singing in the bus. Uh, so tell us about the celebrations that followed this uh, remarkable achievement. Also, well, uh, we've obviously got like quite a quite a good crowd back home. Um, you know, they we call it the the Castle Corner crew, um, and obviously, you know, they they weren't really there in force and stuff like that because you know it's, it's a long way away here in Australia, so they obviously couldn't come along. So we were just you know kind of um, giving it our all, singing some of the tunes that the boys back home give us. Um, yeah, just good vibes and, and very happy. Brian, the, the World Cup Super League has obviously played a, a huge part in Zimbabwe's development and, and getting to you know where you are now and in the T20 qualification for the World Cup. I was noting that the board has recently issued um, its first raft of female player contracts as well, so developing in that sense. Are, are you concerned by the fact that there is no more World Cup Super League and even looking at, say, fixtures against Australia and England, there, there will be none for, for Zimbabwe against those two countries over the next five years? How do you see that landscape? Um, it, it's kind of a tricky one, to be honest, Alison. Like, like you said, uh, without the opportunity of, of, of playing those big teams, um, you know, in the, the Cricket World Cup Super League cycle. Um, and that's kind of what the Cricket uh, Super League has kind of created, an opportunity for us to play those teams that we haven't been playing. Um, so it is going to be sad. Um, and, you know, kind of hopefully we can put in some good performances that, you know, kind of entices um, those big teams to to want to organise some bilateral series. We're not worrying too much about, you know, kind of what's going on around that's kind of out of our control. Um, we're just enjoying our cricket. Well, we wish you best of luck for the T20. And of course, congratulations on the win over Australia. It's so good to have you with us on Stumps. Thank you. So that was Ryan Bell, Zimbabwe leg spinner. Um, Jim, we said a couple of weeks ago, it wasn't particularly well known that Australia were playing white ball matches against Zimbabwe. Has that cut through now with this result? Is, has there been a sense of shock waves with Zimbabwe beating Australia? Uh, less so than had it been in, in the cricket season, I think, because uh, we're still pretty much overwhelmed here with finals in the uh, AFL, Rugby League, South Africa's Rugby Union team's been here losing and then winning. Um, a bloke called Kyrgios has been smashing his rackets in New York. Um, there, there seems to be a fair bit going on, but it, it did get more of a mention on the news than it normally would because Australia lost. And a lot of people say, what? They bowled them out for tuppence the other day. How did they lose? So, um, yeah. And, and now New Zealand are giving Australia a, a run for their money. And the crowds actually uh, up there in uh, Cairns at the moment are pretty strong. I mean, it's like like it's not midsummer in Sydney, I suppose. It's quite warm. And there are a lot of people there in their shorts and having a few drinks and, and enjoying it. So uh, it, it's got an atmosphere of its own, but it, it is a little removed from... Uh, uh, the main stage of winter sport uh, reaching its finale with all sorts of finals going on. At least the climate in Australia does lend itself. You can move to different parts of the country and still play cricket outside of the traditional cricket season. Charu, um, you've spoken a number of times about how the perceived demise of one day international you know, cricket may continue or the way it is at the moment. Um, do results like this, though, show the, the value of the way the ODI Super League has worked. Absolutely. I think one day is uh, still have a long way to go. Uh, if at all they're irrelevant, then they're well behind Test Match Cricket, I think. Because shorter forms of the game, as we all know, do narrow the gaps between, in the standards between countries. And, uh, you know, every once in a while, there will be a result which will gladden uh, the, the lesser nations. Because for them, this is, this is a very important ladder uh, of, of somehow get, gaining more respect in the world of cricket by an odd win here, there and the other. So it will remain relevant for quite a while. Uh, I think lesser nations, partic the, the, the top nations may claim that one day internationals may get boring at one point or time. But I think for the lesser nations, if I can call them that, I mean no disrespect, it's a very important stepping stone 
to reaching the higher levels of cricket because we need more nations, that's for sure. We can't have six or eight nations just lording it over all the time. Next on Stumped, what do the former First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama, and England fast bowler Mark Wood have in common? Well, they are both authors of a self-help book. And no prizes for guessing which of them we have on Stumped this week. It is a warm welcome to Michelle... No, it is Mark Wood who joined us on Stumped. I caught up with him and I asked him what on earth made him think that he could become a self-help guru. Well, I was a bit worried there when you started Michelle Obama. I didn't actually know that. So I was like, what's the link here? But I'm pleased that, uh, I'm pleased that that's a great link, that. But I think do, doing something different, I didn't want it to be a, a stereotypical, like, I did this, uh, I've been injured, I played cricket, because that would be boring for anybody to read. So I try to do a bit of a different spin on it, um, do something um, that hopefully, if you're not just into cricket, other people might like it as well, if they can get on board with that. It's a bit lighthearted, a bit fun. And I think that's what matters to the book, really. I think I've done it with um, Vish, who I'm sure you know well. Great yeah, guy. Yeah, Hansaraja. Yeah. Yes, great guy. Um, journalist and, and he really thought of it like sort of brought out the fun side so it was it was nice and easy it was very relaxed a bit like this chat um it was just you know very much speaking to somebody like over the phone or face to face it was it was very relaxed and I think hopefully the book comes across that way as well yeah I do like the fact that you're sitting on the kitchen floor to have the chat with us at the moment <laughs> it is very relaxed like from going through the book it the the, the way it's treated that the format is not your standard autobiography if you like it because you know it has got this tongue-in-cheek sort of self-help element to it why yeah. and whose idea was it to sort of format it in this way because you have interruptions from friends and teammates throughout the book who, who interject called the woodlife by the way yeah um yes yeah, so yeah the woodlife great shout um so this sort of came up with the idea i mean we talked about it that we didn't want it to just be a stereotypical autobiography so um, that's why it's a little bit different. I'm, I'm sure most people agree I'm a little bit different as a fast bowler, a small, skinny guy who tries to bowl 90 miles an hour and fall over every other ball. Um, so a little bit different in my actual bowling. And hopefully this book is a little bit, you know, different as well. I mean, if you want to learn how to bowl fast, that is one of the chapters. We've got other chapters um, as well. Like maybe you want to give a, how to give a great best man speech or, you know, how to kill time. It could be in the dress room or kill time in life or whatever like that. So, it's just through my stories and my experiences of daft little ways to, to get around things, I guess. A big theme of the book, what really came across to me is how important your friends and your family are to you. And you mentioned Ben Stokes. He's actually written the foreword to the book. Um, yeah, he, he calls you a clown and a joker and a 32-year-old who acts like a 16-year-old or, or vice versa. Um, just tell me a little bit more about your relationship with him, where it started and how it's evolved. I've always been close with Stokesy since we days at Durham. Um, he was one of the guys, you know, that when I first got into the Durham Academy, he was someone that I headed off with and he put his arm around us. And he's been slightly ahead of me in terms of his, his development. He played before me for, for Durham, he played before me for England. So when I caught up and went through to Durham, went through to England, he was already in the team, which was a, a big help for me. And um, we used to car share together and travel around everywhere together. Um, I'll not tell you that his taste in music was, was horrendous, but... Um, eventually, uh, I think I'll get that out of him. But it's it's great to have somebody so close, and I'm, I'm really proud and, and honoured that he could he could do the forward for my book. In a daft way, one of the one of the best things I remember about Stokesy. So we used to any time we can get in any city, we want to go to the cinema together. Stokesy's got to buy everything. He wants ice cream, he wants sweets, he wants popcorn, he wants a whole lot. But one night we couldn't get out, so we decided to watch the film in his room. After five minutes, he fell asleep on his bed. So I had to take his shoes off for him, shut his curtains, get him in bed, <laughs> all while he was asleep. Next morning, I acted like nothing was happening. What, why didn't you stay for the movie? I said, you're joking, you were asleep after five minutes. How do you think, how do you think the curtains were shut? How did you think you got in bed? Just, I don't get enough credit, Ali, honestly. That, that's mateship, that is real mateship. <laughs> um, you seem to be quite a superstitious person as well, is that fair to say? Because there's Absolutely. a particular instance you described during England's innings at the 2019 World Cup final. Tell us about that. I mean, little things for me, like even cracks on the floor. I'll not stand on like the lines on the floor. Um, if we lose a wicket, I can't sit in that space. I've got to sit somewhere else. And often if, if we've got a partnership, I'll be in that position for the rest of the game. I don't like watching it live, any of the play live, because it just makes me so nervous. I just waste energy. So often when you see 50s and 100s and lads are clapping on the balcony, I'm never there because I'm in the back room <laughs> trying, to, trying to keep it cool and, and not being allowed to move. So... 
yeah, quite superstitious. The World Cup final, I tried five or six times, five different seats. And of course, the famous one that I managed to watch 20 overs from was the, the washing machine. So <laughs> um, to, to, you know, even tell that story now, it, it's beyond belief that I actually, the World Cup final, I spent 20 overs on the washing machine with the, with the attendant doing the washing at the time as well, by the way. Could you either leave me with something and my co-presenters, either a bit of advice from the book that will stand us all in good stead on a general basis or, or something completely new that's just a good bit of advice for life? Don't take yourself too seriously, which I think is the book, is the book in a nutshell. I think, um, you know, get as many life experiences as you can. I've been to Australia, India, all these other places and experienced different things and it, it's all helped me to the person that I am, but never forget where you come from. That is sound advice. Woody, good luck with the book and of course the rest of the season and moving to those tours this winter as well. It's been great to chat. Thanks, Ali. That was a very sound piece of advice, I thought. So Jim and Chari, I'm going to turn it on to you guys on the topic of self-help. Is there one bit of life advice each that you could pass on to me as well? What what bit of advice either, you know, if somebody maybe passed down to you that you can share with, with our audience? I've crystallised it for you, uh, Ali, through all the advice I've had from um, my mother and my father going way back. So I'll crystallise it like this, and it's the advice I gave my youngest son when he made his first grade uh, debut at the end of last season. And I said, come over here. Uh, he said, what's going on, Dad? I said, remember the advice I gave you when you were six years old? He said, no, no, what was that? It was, watch the ball. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Cherry, what about you? I'd, I'd love to have people deal with this lifetime with respect and humility. That's a wonderful combination, I thought. I try and follow it myself. And uh, even in the world of sport, if they do that, it'll be great. It just, I think, brings a, a great sense of calm. So do try and go through life with respect for all. Well, I, I remember my dad always saying to us kids, if you ever ask for any advice, he'd just say, never get off a moving bus. Which is very practical, you know, like life advice. But I think it's very important to, to take a moment to appreciate and to celebrate the small things. Well, that is it for this week's Stumps. I will say my thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma and, of course, to you for listening. And we'll see you again for more chat next week. Until then, bye-bye. From the BBC World Service, in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumps.